Hello everyone, uh, this is me, Ahmed uh, Al-Garhi. As you know, I'm an assistant professor at uh, Moretta College. Uh, it is my pleasure to be with you today, uh, talking to uh, students of the Kuwait University. Uh, by the way, I have many Kuwaiti students here. Also, I have uh, a Kuwaiti flag in my office. So uh, it's always a pleasure to talk to uh, Kuwaiti students. Okay, so um, thank you for the invitation. And uh, today we will uh, talk about little introduction about hydraulic fracturing. Okay, so uh, let's begin. So uh, to cover the basics of hydraulic fracturing, I need to talk about uh, what is formation damage. Also, I need to know what is well stimulation. Then I will talk about what is hydraulic fracturing, why we do it, and finally, little information about uh, the equipment and material, okay? So basically, formation damage is uh, uh, a disease may uh, affect my reservoir. So this is the, 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 the good way I like to use uh, to teach my students here is always remember that you as a petroleum engineer, you work as a doctor. You are like a physician. When uh, uh, a patient feels something wrong with his health or her health, for sure we go to see the doctor, okay? So when you talk to the doctor, the doctor will ask you what is the symptoms, what do you feel, what is wrong uh, uh, in your body? And most likely you have a disease. So the disease, this is the formation damage. So a doctor is a petroleum engineer. The patient is your reservoir, maybe a gas reservoir, maybe an oil reservoir, maybe um, you know water and oil and gas all at the same time. So there's uh, different types of reservoirs. And this is my patient. This is the reservoir. We are uh, studying oil and gas in the universities to keep these oil and gas reservoirs healthy and uh, produce, you know, producing uh, a lot of uh, oil and gas, okay? So I want you today to know what is, what kind of disease may uh, happen to the oil, to the hydrocarbon reservoir. Also, I want you to know what is the symptoms, okay? Also, I want you to know what is the medicine, okay? So it should be easy and interesting uh, lecture. So please give me all your attention. Remember again, when you feel something wrong with your uh, body, you go out to see the doctor and the doctor will ask you uh, about the symptom. Uh, he will try to do some uh, diagnosis to know exactly what kind of disease. So he may ask you to do uh, a blood test he may ask you to do a scan, and at the end, he will figure out what is exactly wrong in your body, and he will tell you, hey, you have this disease, and you need to take this medicine or this uh, remedy. And in oil and gas, we have copy the same concept, and you as a petroleum engineer, you are the doctor, the hydrocarbon reservoir, this is your patient, and we are trying to know what is the disease, what is the symptoms, and what is the medicine, okay? Okay, so formation damage is a kind of disease, but actually it is not one type of disease. It is many, many, many types of disease, okay? So formation damage may happen to any formation, maybe if it is a sandstone formation, if it is uh, limestone, if it is dolomite, if it is shale, all these kind of, uh, you know, uh, all of these types of reservoirs may have uh, formation damage. Also, this formation damage may happen at any time. So maybe from day one production, or maybe after one or two years, there's uh, all, uh, you know, uh, chances may happen. So how to figure out um, uh, there is a problem, there is a formation damage problem, you may notice there is a loss of well performance. The well used to produce, uh, let's say, 1,000 barrels every day. 
but today you find it 500. You keep asking yourself why you lost 50% of your production. So maybe there is a formation damage, maybe something else, but you need to check that, yes, maybe there is a formation damage. So most likely uh, a formation damage cause uh, plugging of pore throats. You know that we have pores, we have pores inside the formation and these pores, which is uh, uh, the voids include, uh, or you know, have the hydrocarbon has maybe has some water, some gas and some oil. And these um, uh, voids must be connected together so the hydrocarbon can flow from somewhere inside the reservoir to another place inside the reservoir or reach the well bore and we can produce it uh, easily later. So if you plug these channels of the pore throats or the little bottleneck connecting the two um, you know, pores beside each other, if you plug this uh, pathway, it means the hydrocarbon cannot move to the wool bore and cannot be produced. Okay, so this is a formation damage. Also, um, a change of waterability. You know that uh, if we are producing oil, I prefer to have a water wet reservoir. A water wet reservoir means your formation of your rock love to keep the water, keep the water inside the reservoir and like to produce the oil, which is favorable. This is what we want, okay? So if you inject a chemical and by mistake, you change your reservoir from being water wet and become oil wet, means your reservoir will keep the oil inside it and will produce water, this will be too bad. Why? Because we are petroleum engineers, not water engineers. We are here in this business to produce oil and gas, not to produce water, okay? Uh, I mentioned it, it may occur anytime. Also, it can take various uh, periods of time. Okay, what else about formation damage? It can be simple, uh, just one type of, uh, of uh, formation damage. Also, it can uh, be uh, multiple types. It is similar to uh, an old man who has uh, many diseases, okay? So when you go to see the physician or the doctor, you may have only one problem, like uh, high blood pressure, for example, or you may have uh, diabetes or whatever uh, problem. But in some cases, especially with old men, uh, or you know, old ladies, you may have multiple diseases at the same time, okay? So formation damage, uh, is very similar and maybe uh, just a single, uh, you know, uh, type or maybe a multiple types. Okay, remember, uh, we always say if you have, let's say, when, when you have a little kid, your dad and mom always, you know, ask you to, uh, to avoid being sick. It is better to avoid being sick than go and see, go to the hospital or go get hospitalized. So it is better always to avoid uh, bad things. So it is the same scenario here. It is always better to avoid formation damage than uh, treat it. Why? Because to treat or to fix a problem of formation damage, it may cost you millions of dollars. And this is not wise to do. Okay. How to identify, how to know uh, there's a formation damage problem. The same thing, if you go to the doctor, he may ask you to do, um, let's say um, a blood test. I will ask you to go to um, uh, a medical lab to get uh, a blood sample from your arm, for example, and they will tell you exactly, you know, if you have anything wrong or not. So uh, also they may, uh, the doctor may ask you to go to um, a scan place to do, let's say scan for your chest or for whatever part of your body. But these things, we use it to identify exactly what is a problem, to know exactly what, is, uh, what kind of disease do you have. Okay, so the same thing here. I may notice there's a loss of wool performance. Okay, 
But when I notice there's a loss of wound performance, I'm not very sure that this is a formation damage. Maybe a natural decline. Maybe. I still don't know. Maybe I, I believe we should do something called PLT or production logging uh, tool. PLT is very, something very similar to when you do a scan for your body. Okay, so you send something over a wire line uh, down to, your, to the wall bore, and you will see exactly what is wrong near the perforation. If the perforation produces water, which part of the perforation produces that water, and how much water, and you can later do some uh, analysis to know exactly what is the problem. Okay, also I may take a sample. I may get a sample uh, from uh, the fluids downhole and I know exactly what kind of problems. Maybe there's a bacteria down, uh, you know, uh, near the wall board, near the uh, perforation, like um, uh, SRB, sulfur reducing bacteria. Maybe there is a scale problem near the uh, perforation. So I need to check all of that and easily I can take a sample and do some analysis and I can figure out what is uh, the problem. Also, I can send a downhole camera to see exactly what is going on. It is very similar when you have uh, something wrong with your stomach and they send something over a cable to your, from your mouse, it goes to your stomach and get some pictures uh, for your stomach and the doctor will know exactly what is wrong uh, with your stomach, okay? Okay, so formation damage is something, uh, we call it qualitative. So I can say you are a good student, but I don't know, you know, go to what level. Maybe I will say you are a bad student or fair student or very good student or excellent student, but we don't know exact scale for your uh, level. So we may say, okay, you get 93% or your GPA is 3.8 or 3.5. So scan is something qualitative. So we can say, hey, we have, uh, uh, sorry, the formation damage is something qualitative. So we need to have a measure. We need to have uh, a number to tell you if that formation damage is too bad or okay, or uh, there is no damage at all. So we invented a scale, we call it skin factor. So a skin factor is just a measure or a scale to know exactly, you know, the, uh, to evaluate the formation uh, damage and to uh, convert formation damage from being something uh, qualitative to be something quantitative, okay? So when you have a positive skin, let's say when I say this reservoir or this formation, that has a scan of uh, plus 20 or plus 50. Plus 50, this is mean positive scan. This mean there is a, a damage problem. Your permeability is damaged, okay? When you have zero scan, the skin factor is zero, means your formation or your reservoir is good, not, uh, no damage happened at all and no stimulation happened at all. So you are healthy, but uh, you did not go to the gym to be stronger or you are not sick and you need to go to the hospital. You are just okay, okay? This is when we say skin factor is zero. When we say the skin factor of S is negative, it means we did a stimulation to the reservoir. Stimulation means you, um, you did something like hydraulic fracturing, like acidizing, like acid fracturing to make your reservoir produce better. It is very similar to say, uh, I'm in a good health. I don't have any problem. I don't have any health problem, but I decided to go to, um, uh, to the gym to do bodybuilding. You know, we are celebrating uh, Big Rami, you know, we're getting the, uh, uh, the medal of Mr. Olympia uh, last few days. And I know that he used to train in uh, Kuwait before. So let's say you are very healthy, you don't have any health problem, but you decided to uh, go to um, uh, the gym 
to uh, do a bodybuilding to become like Big Ronnie. Okay, so what you are doing right now is stimulation, trying to make your health better. You are not facing any problem, but you want to make your health better. Okay, so this happened when we see the negative skin. When we see the skin is, let's say, negative two or negative uh, three or negative four, it means we did a stimulation technique. And stimulation, by definition, means to make something better. Okay? Okay, so keep in your mind, S or the skin factor may be positive, means formation damage, may be negative, means the stimulation of you, make, you made the well instead of producing 1,000 barrel as usual, now it produced 1,500 or 2,000 barrel. So you make it, you made the, the well produce better. Or the skin factor is just zero. It means no damage, no um, uh, stimulation. Okay. How to quantify? Here is the equation we use. Is, this is the most famous um, uh, equation to calculate uh, skin. And we call it Hawkins uh, formula. And we have the permeability. We have the permeability of the damaged zone, which is the damaged zone surrounding the wool bore. Here, look at the mouse. Here, this is a damaged zone. So this is key S, this is the permeability of the damaged zone. And len, this is a natural uh, you know, logarithm. So this is len. And we have Rs, which is uh, the radius of the uh, damaged zone. And we have Rw, this is the radius of the wool bore. Okay, and see, this is your wool bore here in the middle, and here is the damaged zone, which is the red one. The the brown, this is the brown, uh, you know, cylinder here or the brown circle here. Also, we have a little damaged zone. We call it the invaded zone, which is the one by green. And when you do a hydraulic fracturing, it is very similar like you create a big crack inside the formation, okay? Okay, I will explain by details what is hydraulic fraction, just wait for a couple of minutes. Let's finish first, what is uh, the different types of uh, formation damage? Formation damage may be mechanical or chemical. Mechanical formation damage may be the solids invaded uh, the formation during drilling. When we drill, we use drilling fluids, and these drilling fluids has a lot of, uh, you know, uh, solids suspended, and these solids suspended may invade and go to the uh, reservoir and damage the permeability. Okay. Also, you may have emulsion. Emulsion is like maybe water in oil or oil in water. You know, if you go to the kitchen and you get one cup of uh, let's say one cup of water and you put this cup of water inside the, the mixer and get two spoons of oil. The, you know, the, uh, the oil you use in food, like the vegetable oil, put two spoons and mix them together. You will find them become like emulsion, okay? And this emulsion, we will call it oil in water, okay? If you get one cup of oil, and get two spoons of water, then we will call it, this is, you know, uh, water in oil, okay? Also, I may have something we call water blockage, which is uh, may happen for gas wells. And water blockage means the water will uh, accumulate somewhere inside your reservoir and it will stop any natural gas from flowing from somewhere inside the reservoir to reach the well bore, okay? Also, the formation damage may be uh, chemical and not mechanical. And chemical, like, um, uh, let's say, bacteria, scale, or any kind of deposition because of a chemical reaction happen inside your wool bore, for example. Okay? So, um, sometimes we have something called sand production, and sometimes we call it fines migration. So I want to tell you what is the main difference between sand production and fines migration. And both of them considered a formation, formation damage. Sand production means you are producing some sands, go with 
the oil and gas and water producing for, produced from the reservoir and reach the whole bore and go to the surface. This means what? If you produce sand, the sand will damage your uh, tubing also will damage your surface facilities. So it is something very bad, okay? But if these solids moved from somewhere inside the reservoir to another place inside the reservoir, but never reached the whole bore, we call that fines migration. So if the solids moves only inside the reservoir from somewhere inside the reservoir to another place inside the reservoir, but not produced, I will call that fines migration. But if it reached the whole bore and start producing the sands with the oil and gas and water, I would call that uh, sand production. Okay, so this is the main difference between fines migration and uh, sand uh, production. Okay, so uh, guys, please, you know, um, uh, feel free to uh, drop me questions. After I finish, I would be happy to answer any question uh, you have. Also, I will send you uh, a PDF from this uh, presentation. Okay. Again, I want to remind you about the doctor, patient, disease, symptoms, uh, diagnosis, and medicine and or remedy. Okay. Remember this model because this model will help you to imagine what is formation damage and what is uh, the medicine we have as a petroleum engineer, which is maybe hydraulic fracturing, maybe acidizing, maybe acid fracturing. But in this lecture, we will focus only in hydraulic fracturing as a medicine, as something good we do to the reservoir to make it produce better. Okay. Well, stimulation. Remember, in oil and gas, we have two famous words. One, we call it well sim reservoir simulation. And this is like we simulate the reservoir and this, this is a kind of uh, reservoir engineer. Well, uh, of, uh, reservoir simulation, okay? But we, but we what we have here in production engineering, we call it well stimulation. Stimulation means to have a plan to make something better, to make something better. Let's say because of COVID-19, because of the uh, coronavirus we have these days, all our Economies, let's say the Kuwaiti economy is declining because of uh, COVID-19. The American economy is declining because of COVID-19. So uh, maybe we need to have uh, economy stimulus plan to make our economy become better again, okay? And recover from uh, COVID-19. So stimulation means to make something better or to fix a problem and make something better. So. Um, in oil and gas, to do well stimulation, it is one of three. Maybe you will do hydraulic fracturing, which is our topic today. Maybe I will do acidizing. Maybe I will do acid fracturing. And maybe in the future, we will talk about acidizing and acid uh, fraction. Okay? Okay, so this is uh, what is well stimulation. So let's go to see what is hydraulic fracturing. Okay, hydraulic fracturing, simply, we are injecting fluid into the well bore, and this fluid, is, we call it engineered fluid, which is a fluid with a recipe, like uh, you are cooking uh, something, uh, a nice food, and we need to follow exactly the same recipe, okay? So we prepare a fract fluid, we prepare something we call propen, this is the propen, and later I will show you what is um, uh, the fract fluid, and we inject that in a high rate to the reservoir, and that rate will build a downhole pressure, and that pressure will keep increasing, increasing, increasing until it crack or break down the reservoir. So you are cracking your reservoir, and this, this cracking uh, procedure will enhance the productivity, okay? It is very similar when you get a hammer and you go to your um, uh, car windshield, your car, the glass you have in your car in front, that we call the windshield, and you hit that by a hammer, boom. When you hit it, you see cracks everywhere. So we do the same thing to the, our, to the formation, to the reservoir. Why you crack it? Because if you crack your reservoir, if you make these fractures, you will 
increase the passes or the contact area between your reservoir and the wool bore, and you will start producing more oil and gas and water. Okay, if you put these cracks in the right place, it means I will, I will produce more oil and gas and I will do my best to avoid producing water because if you produce a lot of water, this is something very bad, okay? Also, after you open your fracture, after you crack it, this fracture by nature will close again. So we need to inject some sands, we call it propent. This is like a small bowls. I have many samples in my office. Okay, different sizes, like a small bowls, very similar to sands, okay? And we inject that, why we inject it? Because after you stop injecting the frac fluid, the fracture you created will close again and you will lose the permeability, the good permeability, you, 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 the good uh, conductivity you made in this fracture. So it is very similar to have something like a, um, this, let's say, you, do you see these markers? I created a fracture and now I wanna close the fracture again, but these markers here in the middle, so I cannot close the fracture to the end. It is the same thing. I will put the propent with this, this uh, balls in the middle between the fracture I open. And when I close the fracture, when the fracture get, uh, try to close, it, it will not get the chance to close to the end and it will have a lot of good conductivity, okay? Okay, so look here, look to the mouse. This is a vertical well, the one to the right, this is a vertical well. And I go to my reservoir and inject fluid, I inject water, and this water has sands with it. So this is, uh, you know, uh, human made sand, we call it propane, okay? We use, sometimes we use natural sand, but you know, uh, most likely we use um, human made sand, okay? We inject them until the pressure increase, increase, the bottom hole pressure increase, 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 until you break down the formation. I can keep pushing on something. If I am very strong, I will break it, okay? If you break it, you will increase the uh, channels that reach the reservoir, that connect the reservoirs with the wool bore, okay? So if you look to the left, this is a horizontal well, and I can inject the fracking fluid again and break down the formation, and I can do that on stages, okay? So if I ask you, I will do that because the permeability is very low. You will, you will say, okay, this is makes sense. The permeability is very low, so the productivity is very low. So maybe I need to do a hydraulic fraction to increase, to uh, produce more oil or gas, okay? But if I have high permeability, is it a need to do hydraulic fraction? Most likely you'll say, okay, there is no need to do that because you told me that the permeability already very high and I'm producing uh, a lot of oil. So why I need to waste money to uh, do hydraulic fraction? Actually, we do hydraulic fracturing for high permeability uh, formations uh, to do sand control. High permeability formations most likely produce a lot of sands and these sands will damage, uh, will damage your tubing, will damage your surface facilities and you will lose a lot of millions of dollars, okay? This is why we need to um, uh, uh, inject we do something we call frack and pack. We inject short and fat fractures to work as a screen, to work as a screen. You know, if you have something that we call a screen, that screen will stop, will produce only, will produce only the, the oil and gas and water. They will flow through the screen and the sands will stop inside the formation. Okay? So if someone asked you, do we do only uh, hydraulic fracturing for, for low permeability reservoirs? The answer is no. We do hydraulic fracturing for low permeability reservoirs and also we do it for high permeability reservoirs, but for a different reason, which is uh, sand control, not to enhance productivity, but for to uh, stop sand production. 
Guys, please uh, give me all your attention and watch this uh, short video to know exactly what is uh, hydraulic fraction. Okay, also it will summarize some other concepts to you. Please watch and listen. There are many formations with multi-zone oil and gas reservoirs that are vertically drilled and stimulated using hydraulic fracturing to optimally recover these hydrocarbons. In this example, we show a well targeting three sandstone layers, although this number may vary in different oil and gas plays. Once the drill rig and other infrastructure is in place, a bit mounted on the end of the drill pipe begins drilling the well. The well is initially drilled to a designated distance below the deepest fresh water source near the surface. The pipe and bit are then removed and surface casing is inserted into the hole. The casing is then secured into place by pumping cement through the casing and through the shoe at the bottom of the hole. The cement barrier and steel casing prevent any contamination of freshwater aquifers. Once the casing cement has set, Drilling of the intermediate section of the hole continues by drilling through the wiper plug, shoe, and cement at the bottom of the well bore and on toward the targeted zones. Throughout the drilling, a mixture called mud is pumped down into the well through the drill pipe. The mud serves to keep the drill bit cool. It carries the cuttings to the surface and provides hydrostatic pressure, prohibiting formation fluids from entering the well bore. As drilling approaches the depth of the first target zone, a technician called a mud logger is brought on location. He analyzes the cuttings, identifying the downhole lithology and any presence of hydrocarbons. As the well is being drilled, he provides real-time information to the company geologist and rig personnel. Once the bottom of the intermediate section is reached, the drill pipe and bit are again removed from the well bore and intermediate casing is inserted into the hole and connected to the surface casing. The intermediate casing is also cemented to secure the hole. The drill pipe and bit are again lowered back into the hole and drills through the wiper plug, shoe, and cement. Once total depth is reached, the drill pipe and bit are removed from the well bore one last time. Next, a logging tool is lowered to the bottom of the well on a wire line. As the tool is pulled back up the entire length of the well, data is gathered to create an electric log. Once the well has been logged and deemed a commercial well, production casing is then inserted. As with the surface and intermediate casing, the production casing is also cemented into the hole. Back on the surface, the drilling rig is no longer needed. A temporary wellhead is installed and the location is prepared for the service crews who will ready the well for production. The first of these steps is to perforate or perf the casing. A perforating gun is lowered by wire line to the lowest of the three target zones. An electrical current is sent down the wire line to the perf gun, setting off a charge which shoots holes through the steel casing, cement, and out a short distance into the target formation. The perf gun is then pulled out of the hole. The next step is to hydraulically fracture or frack the zone. Here, sand or other propants are pumped into the well bore under extremely high pressure. When the mixture reaches the target zone, the pressure forces it out through the perf holes and out into the sandstone formation, causing it to fracture. This creates a fairway connecting the reservoir to the well and allows the released oil to flow to the well bore. Next, a bridge plug is placed inside the production casing, isolating the fracked zone. The hydraulic fracture process is then repeated for zones two and one. Now that the frack process is complete, the plugs are drilled out and production tubing is lowered into the well bore to reach each of the productive zones. 
hydrocarbons can now flow simultaneously from each of the zones into the well. The next step is to install a permanent wellhead and other necessary surface equipment. Sometimes a pump jack is used to help bring the oil to the surface. The final step is to install and connect a pipeline to the well that will transport the oil to the nation's pipeline network. Wells that produce from several zones simultaneously result in greater cost efficiency and increased productivity. Okay, so the good thing about this video, uh, you know, it summarizes a lot of, uh, you know, uh, the history of the oil from day one when we start, you know, uh, drilling. When we get the mud logger, when we could do the casing, when you do the fracking. So um, uh, I wish it is a uh, helpful, helpful uh, video. Okay, so if you want to work in hydraulic fracturing in the future, you need to memorize uh, this uh, graph the same way you memorize your name. Remember, when you inject, the bottom hole pressure will increase. Look to the mouse will increase, 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 increase to this point. Look to this circle, red circle. We call that breakdown pressure. Pressure will increase, 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 then boom. You break down the formation. So now the formation cracked into two pieces or maybe many, many, many pieces, maybe 100 pieces, okay? So look here, here's uh, in the X axis, this is a time the x-axis, in the y-axis, y -axis, this is the bottom hole pressure. And when you inject, we, are, uh, we do our best to keep a constant injection rate. This is the injection rate, look to the mouse. Okay, then when you inject, the bottom hole pressure will increase, increase, increase until the breakdown will happen. Okay, then I will do some, after I stop injecting, I will do some well testing to get some, uh, you know, uh, uh, information about the reservoir and uh, to know, uh, to evaluate the fracking uh, job. Okay, so try to memorize that uh, in your mind. Okay, so what is the applications of hydraulic fracturing? We use hydraulic uh, fracturing to enhance productivity to make a well that produce uh, 500 barrel a day, produce 800 or 1,000, okay? So we, we may use the hydraulic fraction to enhance productivity or increase production rate. Also, we may use it to as a sand control uh, technique. If we have a high permeability uh, reservoir and that reservoir uh, produce a lot of sands, I can do something we call frack and pack, which is short and fat, Fractures. And these uh, short fractures will work as a screen inside the formation and stop all the sand production. Okay. Also, sometimes we have uh, hydraulically fractured wells in water flooding uh, project. So, whenever we do hydraulic water flooding, we do want to fracture these wells. We want to use it as a normal injectors. But by time, the formation keep cold down, cold down because uh, the, the fluid in the surface, when I injected uh, the, the frac fluid from the surface will be in low, low temperature and the formation will be in high temperature. So we will keep cooling down the reservoir and by time the breakdown pressure of the formation will decrease. And maybe after two months, after one year, after two years, this formation will get fractured unintentionally, like by mistake. I don't want to fracture this formation, but because the cooling down effect in the, you know, in, the, in this, for this injector in a, a water flooding project, it get fractured unintentionally, okay? Also here in the United States and many other countries, sometimes we use hydraulic fracturing as a disposal technique. If you wanna trash your uh, uh, drill cuttings, if you want to trash any the, any produced water, you can find a location under the ground, like isolated zone underground, under the ground, and we we uh, we inject all this bad stuff of the this you know uh, waste uh, material. We inject it under the ground. It is very similar, like when you decide to have a trash can 
uh, under the ground. But this trash can must be far away from any freshwater zone, far away from any hydrocarbon zone, and also far away from any casing setting point because a casing setting point will, will uh, you know, uh, is a weak uh, place and may by uh, mistake, you may fracture the casing show and you get this disposal go up again to the surface. Okay, so uh, the conclusion here, we have many applications for hydraulic fracturing and not only uh, to enhance productivity. Okay, every time I keep reminding you about this model and let's now talk about why we do hydraulic fracturing. So I told you that hydraulic fracturing can enhance productivity, but the question is why? Okay, so I wanna give you an example before I start explaining this. Imagine you have a, a, a square in, uh, in Kuwait city, and this square is very crowded. Let's say during the rush hour, let's say from, let's say 2 p.m. to 4 p.m., for example, every day, and this square very, very crowded and has many traffic jams. And you know, sometimes during summer, some cars, let's say um, because of temperature, stop uh, walking or any problem happens. Sometimes there is some accidents happen because of, there is many, many cars in, in, in one place. And hydraulic fracturing is very similar like you are using a highway. And instead of going through, when you finish your job or finish your school, you're, uh, you go from the university and now you are driving your car back home and you, need, you must go through this square and the square is very crowded. This crowd means there's a lot of formation damage. But if you have a hydraulic fracture, it is very similar like you go from your, your university to your home using a highway, no traffic jam, and you know you will have very high speed. So this highway, this is exactly the hydraulic fracture, okay? This crowded square, this is a formation uh, damage, okay? Or a damaged formation. So long time ago, more than you know, 200 years ago, uh, a gentleman called Henry Darcy. He's a French. He was a French uh, civil engineer, and he used to do some experiments to design a fountain. A fountain, you know, the you know that thing that you know the water go out and make a very nice you know uh, scene. So um, uh, Henry Darcy was trying to set a law, what we call it right these days, Henry, um, uh, Darcy law, okay? To uh, do some calculations for a, a water fountain. And later, because we found this, uh, 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 this Darcy law, this equation, very helpful in oil and gas, we start adopting the same equation and any production book in oil and gas now, you will find it maybe in chapter one or chapter two, you will see Darcy Low, one of the very basic stuff in, in our industry. So the basic model that Henry Darcy introduced, he has a pipe, this pipe, okay? And we have two points, A and B, and uh, this pipe has a lens, also it has uh, you know, an, a cross-section area, the diameter and the cross-section area of that uh, pipe. And this is the equation. Q is the injection rate, or maybe the production rate. You know, the difference between production and injection is only this uh, negative sign. Sometimes you will you see the negative sign. Some, uh, sometimes you will not see this negative sign. Okay, so A, this is the cross-section area of this pipe. Pressure at point B here, minus pressure at point A here, divided by viscosity, mu, this is the viscosity, and L, this is the length of the pipe. And we have K, which is a new term, which is the permeability, okay? So let me ask you this question. If I told you this pipe, I will get a bigger pipe. That bigger pipe will, can carry uh, more uh, water and oil or not? You will say yes, for sure. If you have a bigger pipe, so if you increase the cross-section area, look to the equation, increase the cross-section area, you will find Q will increase. This is makes sense. I mean, easily we can, we know that. If you are in your home, if you have a, 
uh, a water pipe in the kitchen or in the bathroom. Uh, if this pipe is bigger, for sure it can get you more water. Okay, so try to remember what I will tell you right now. If you can increase the contact area between the reservoir and the well bore, for sure Q or the production rate will increase. This is the same concept. It is not me who told you this. This is Henry Darcy who told you this, okay? Because look to Henry equation or Henry law or Darcy law, increase the cross section area, A, you will increase Q automatically, okay? So if I ask you this question, why look to the bottom uh, picture, why a horizontal well produce more oil than a vertical well? Simply because the contact area in the vertical well, the contact area between the reservoir and the well bore here is less than the contact area if I have a horizontal well. If you increase the contact area, means you will increase productivity. And in hydraulic fracturing, all what we are doing is increasing the contact area. When you break down the formation, create new fractures, these fractures, will increase the contact area between the well and the reservoir, okay? And this is why we get more production by hydraulic fracturing. Also, because I inject a lot of propane, the sand with the frac fluid, I will create this fracture, and this fracture will be filled with this uh, propane. And this propane has very high permeability. The permeability of this propane is way uh, higher uh, maybe hundreds of times higher than the permeability of the formation. So you create a very conductive pass from the from deep inside the reservoir and brings all the oil and gas and water directly and immediately to the wool board. Okay, so now I am enhancing the conductivity. The conductivity is uh, the fracture width times the fracture permeability. Okay, so this is a second reason why a hydraulic fracture increases productivity. The first one, because increase the contact area between the well and the reservoir. The second, because I'm creating a conductive uh, pass and uh, increase the conductivity. And finally, because hydraulic fracturing will not fix any damage problem, but will bypass it. Like you have that crowded square in, in Kuwait City, but instead of go, driving your car through the, that square, that crowded square, you will go through the highway at the top of that square. You will not stop uh, you know, in the middle of your way in that crowded square. So we call it bypassing the formation damage or bypassing the crowd when you drive your car. Okay. The last thing I have for you today is uh, a little introduction about hydraulic fracturing equipment and material, the material we are using and the equipment we are using. Look, this picture from somewhere here in the United States, and you see a lot of pumps. Look to the picture, you will see uh, red, you know, whenever you see a lot of red, most likely this is Halliburton, okay? So you will see uh, some tubes in the middle, we call it manifold, and we see pumps, in the two sides, two sides of these pipes. So here is a list, here is uh, some uh, pumps, hydraulic fraction pumps, and here is hydraulic fraction pumps, and we have the manifold in the middle, and we have something called the blender here, in this side. If you look to the other side, you will see the well head here, okay? So we may have pumps, we may have tanks, these tanks for the water, for the propent, for the chemicals. Also, we may have uh, blenders. The blender, this is uh, like a, the mixer that mix the frac fluid with the propent, with the chemicals, and mix all of them together and send it to uh, the low pressure side of the uh, manifold. The low pressure side connected to the pumps. The pumps will take it and inject it again to the manifold as a high pressure and that high pressure fluid goes directly to the well to the well head and get injected 
and that the pressure, the downhole pressure, keep increasing, increasing, increasing until you break down the formation and crack it. Okay, and you get more uh, production. Also, I believe maybe in the future we may have a, a, a talk about you know hydraulic production operation because there's a lot of things we need to say uh, about it. Also, near the wall head, you will see um, a, a big van, including like a, some office, you know, office and some computers, and we call it a data uh, van or a monitoring truck. Okay, and. We have the frac engineers there, we have the supervisors, the job supervisors there, we have the, the company man there, and they can easily watch everything in the location and easily they can control everything in the location by uh, you know, uh, computers. And also the, the job supervisor has, a mic, has a, a mic, has a headset, and he can talk to all the frac uh, you know, uh, uh, team in the location and give them a direction when to inject, when to stop, when to increase the, the propane concentration and so on. Okay, so I used to track my students here and ask them some uh, funny questions. And I, I, I show them this picture and I, I ask them, hey, try to find me where is the uh, workover rig. And they keep looking in the picture and someone say, hey, the workover rig is here or here and actually, there is no workover rig in this location. This is how the workover looks like. A workover rig, very similar to a drilling rig, but it is smaller. A, you know, a drilling rig will have maybe three pipes connected together. So the, the mast or the tower is very high. In, in deep water drilling, we may have four pipes connected and one pipe is like around 30 feet. So um, uh, one stand is like 90 feet in drilling in deep water, maybe it will be four, four pipes connected together. But in work over, most likely only two pipes connected together. So it is uh, shorter, like 60 feet, okay? So it was like a, uh, a funny questions to, to be sure that students are awake and not uh, sleeping. Okay, here is again, uh, another a second picture of a location, hydraulic fracturing location. And by the way, if you want to learn more about hydraulic fracturing operations, you will find many lectures and many videos on PyoPetro YouTube channel about that. So we use a lot of fresh water. And fresh water in, in some countries is a very big challenge. Let's say here in the United States, when we frack shale, we, we consume a lot of fresh water. And if I want to uh, you know, frack organic shale in Kuwait or in Saudi, I may get a big, pro a big question mark about there is not enough fresh water in the country to use it in, in, in fracking. This is why we don't develop shale uh, these days in, in, in Kuwait or Saudi or even in Egypt or, or you know, in, in Libya or Algeria. There is a lot of uh, organic shale, but we cannot develop it easily because we don't have enough uh, fresh water, okay? So we use fresh water. We use KCL, which is uh, like a salt. Also, we use something called guar, and guar is something very similar to starch, something, a plant we, um, we, uh, we planted in India, somewhere, you know, near India. And it is very similar to beans, and we grind it, and it becomes something like a starch. When we mix it with water, it makes something uh, looks like a milk. Then we add something called a uh, crosslinker. So it become like a jello. I will show you uh, some pictures. Also, I will use propane. If you don't know what is propane, this is a propane, okay? We don't let students uh, touch it because uh, when we made it from ceramics, uh, sometimes uh, it may uh, you know, uh, cause uh, cancer. So we don't like students to touch uh, this stuff or inhale or smell it, okay? Okay, um, here is, let me go to this layer, uh, this slide first, and I will go back again, because I want to show you. Watch this. This is a fact fluid. 
very, very similar to the jelly we eat, the jello we eat. Okay? Okay, so this guy, we call it fluid tech. He works in the, as a, in the frac team and he prepares the frac fluid. Okay, look, the, here is the, the guar. Look to this picture. Here is the guar and it's very similar to beans. See, this is beans here. We, we get the, the seeds, then we grind it. We, or we, you know, we, uh, we mill it. So it becomes like a powder. We mix this powder with water it becomes something like a milk here. This is a milky, uh, you know, uh, liquid. If we add coarse gel, coarse you know, if we add coarse which is a chemical, it will connect this uh, liquid together and make it polymer and become like this jello. So this is the guar added to mix it with water, add, mix it with a uh, coarse linker it become this jello. And this is a frac fluid. We just, we need to add the propen to it and that's it. And we, we pump it, okay? Okay. So, let me show you this. Okay. So the frac fluids, more than 90% of the frac fluids is just water. But remember, it is not any water, it is fresh water. It, it must have specifications. When we get this water trucks uh, into the, uh, to the location, we need to get samples and we test it and we'll be sure that there is um, the iron, the phosphate and all any, uh, if, you know, we check all uh, solids or, you know, um, uh, chemicals inside this water and be sure that it meets the uh, required specifications. Okay. Also, uh, around nine percent of this uh, fluids injected will be the propen itself. Okay, and less than 0.5 percent, something very, very, very minor. Here, there is a, it is a lot of chemicals: KCL, surfactant, gelling agent, scale inhibitor, breakers, pH adjusting, um, uh, ion control. Uh, bio a lot of things, okay? And because of these chemicals, hydraulic fracturing in most of uh, European countries is banned. There is no fracturing in Germany. There is no fracturing in, in uh, France, for example, because they like to keep their environment uh, as it is, and they don't like to inject these chemicals underground, okay? Why do you do it this way? Because you have green political parties in, in, uh, in, in, in Europe and you cannot approve doing hydraulic fracturing there. But in Kuwait, in Egypt, in the United States, we are more business oriented and we, we do this business and we do our best to keep uh, uh, you know, uh, our environment safe and not damaging the environment. Okay. Here is my uh, last slide for today. Just I want to show you, this is the propen, the real propen. I told you after I create the fractures, now I'm opening a fracture. After I stop pumping, the fracture will close again because there are the stresses inside the formation and these stresses will close the fracture again. And I want to keep something in the middle, just something to keep this fracture open. So if I ask you, what is the function of propen? In one statement, to keep fracture open to keep the fracture open after I stop pumping. But you see there is different sizes of propen. There's different sizes. Sometimes there's uh, bigger uh, propen, sometimes smaller propen. And we decide which, uh, what is the right size based on our understanding to the mechanical properties of the formation. I need to know an estimate for young, the youngest models and Poisson's ratio of that uh, formation. Then I will decide what should be the right uh, propen size uh, for that formation. Also, I need to know an estimate for the stresses in, in this formation to know how strong must be uh, my propen because if my propen uh, uh, is not strong enough, will get it will get crushed after that by the, the by the air's uh, stresses. Okay, and I want to keep my propen uh, as it is and not 
cache. Look to this picture to the right. Here is the propane will stay inside the, uh, the fractures and will enhance the uh, uh, permeability the, or the conductivity of that formation. Okay. Okay, so uh, this is, uh, uh, we are almost one hour now. And uh, please go ahead. And if you have any question for me, I will be happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much. Everything is clear. Thank you. Have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. Thank you.